during world war two there was great emphasis placed upon training and many of the nation's finest boxers and wrestlers were enlisted to instruct recruits in the manly art of self defense for many years police officers have been using this science in their everyday work with the limitation of being required to apply only that degree of force necessary to subdue and restrain a suspect or risk the accusation of so called police brutality our work is further complicated in that many of the suspects we will be called upon to subdue will be veterans of the war trained in commando tactics therefore familiar with and able to break the holds most commonly used it is the purpose of this film to demonstrate not only restraining and defensive holds least apt to be broken but also to point out the dangers of using the wrong tactics when meeting a trained and experienced suspect Certain parts of a man's anatomy are extremely vulnerable to attack. These include the larynx or Adam's apple, the elbow, groin, and the knee. This holds true regardless of the man's size or degree of physical development. Pressure properly applied at these weak points will offset any advantage of size or strength which may be present. The knowledge of these leverage principles is vital as the first fundamental of training in self-defense. Certain holes are easily broken because of the comparative weakness of the thumb in relation to the rest of the hand. A turn of the wrist towards the thumb will always be effective in obtaining release from a one-handed grip. Where two-handed grips are used, it is only necessary to bring your other hand into play to apply additional leverage, always toward the opponent's thumb. A throttle hold may be broken by an upward thrust of your arm held in the shape of a V or wedge. This may be followed through with a knee to the groin if necessary. The approach of the officer to the suspect is all important. Here's what can happen when the officer uses a direct frontal approach. The suspect has the choice of several methods of causing the officer not only to look ridiculous, but also to incur serious bodily injury. As 95% of all men are right-handed, the correct approach is to step to the right side of the suspect prior to questioning him. The officer should then place his hand behind the suspect's elbow and grasp the material of his coat or other garment so as to be able to pull him off balance if any offensive action is attempted. Of course, if he insists, Raising your right knee will concentrate the full force of his attack where it will do the most good. If the suspect turns away or jerks his arm free, you are then behind him and in the proper position to apply a rear strangle come along. If he anticipates your intention and turns to the right, grab his clothing with your right hand, leaving your left hand free to apply the hold. If the suspect seems cooperative, don't be carelessly caught off guard, as could happen here, by not watching his head and arm. In the proper method, the officer watches the suspect's arms for a tip-off of an offensive move. Then, if it comes, he is in a position to apply pressure behind the knees and throw his opponent to the ground.
After years of trial and error, this modified bar hammer lock has been developed and will hereinafter be referred to as the police hold. For all practical purposes, it is as unbreakable as any hold can be. Properly applied and with the right forearm locked under the suspect's chin, he may be easily controlled and led to a wall or any vertical object for handcuffing and thorough shakedown. Though the suspect's left arm is free, he is unable to put it to any offensive use. While circumstances alter cases, it is a good general rule to handcuff a dangerous suspect prior to a thorough search of his person. Note the position of the officer's right foot, ready to trip the suspect upon the first false move. An alternate method is to drop the suspect to the ground, engaging the vulnerable bend of his elbow with the right knee. Then bring the left knee in to complete the restraint, leaving the hands free to carry on the handcuffing operation. From the previously demonstrated rear strangle, the knee drop may be used to temporarily reduce the suspect's fighting ability to a minimum. As the officer follows through, he drops his right knee onto the suspect's lower rib. Depending upon the force and rapidity of the fall, the suspect will be incapacitated for an indefinite period. From the rear of the suspect, you can easily drop him with a kick behind his knee. Continuing pressure on this vulnerable spot will increase his cooperation in the handcuffing operation by about 100%. In extreme cases, the flying mare may be used, but it is not recommended as a general practice as it places the suspect momentarily behind the officer. However, this come along is easily applied and very effective in leading the suspect to the radio car. Note that the right hand is used to guide him as well as to keep him from falling forward to break the hold. Here's what can happen when the officer approaches between two likely looking suspects. When an officer stops two persons for questioning, it is vital that he stay on the extreme right and keep the one man between him and the second suspect at all times. The problem of restraining female suspects is a difficult one. What usually happens is something like this. Control of her elbows is highly important. With those locked behind her back, she has no choice but to submit, if not gracefully. Well, what have we here? He seems cooperative enough, but the little lady has other plans. Sorry, pal, but this could go on all night. Who was it said that women were the weaker sex? This hold leaves the officer's right hand free to ward off bites and scratches. The strangle holes are dangerous and cannot be broken through strict adherence to Marcus of Queensbury rule. The officer is justified in using these tactics where the suspect is the aggressor and has the advantage of a surprise attack. The same is true of the clumsy and easily broken bear hug.
If the officer's arms are pinioned, he may use his knuckles to good advantage in breaking the hole. If his arms are free, he is able to use this alternate method, in all instances following through with the knee drop to the lower rib. Two methods of defense against swinging fists are shown and are equally effective. If the officer has been thrown to the ground, he should keep his feet between his body and the opponent so as to be able to defend himself against a kick in this manner. If the suspect is on his back and kicking, the officer should concentrate on grabbing one foot while keeping out of the way of the other. Then cross the opponent's legs. By dropping the knee on the suspect's ankle, he can be easily brought under control. If necessary to actually wrestle with the suspect, always lie with your body across his shoulders and at a 90 degree angle. Your weight plus the leverage of your body will prevent the suspect from turning under you and your high position deprives him of the full use of his arm, allowing you to apply an arm-breaking hold. If the officer is on the bottom, his first move should be to get both hands free and together for additional leverage and twisting away from the hold. Should a suspect, armed with a gun, take the officer by surprise at close quarters, there is a moment of indecision during which you have the opportunity of disarming him. You have the advantage of selecting the exact instant in which to make your move. Speed and agility are of the utmost importance, and the body must be pivoted out of the possible line of fire as your arm sweeps the gun to one side. Do not telegraph your intention by any movement of your eyes or change of expression. If approached from the rear, first determine in which hand the suspect holds the firearm. When you make your move, work fast and with all the strength you can muster. To master this technique takes lots of practice but it may save your life. In disarming a man with a shotgun or rifle, the length of the weapon is to your advantage from a leverage standpoint. A quick reverse twist followed by a step through and a full turn will throw the suspect. When attacked from the rear, you must first determine how the weapon is held to decide which way to turn. There are three chief methods of attack with a knife, the underhand, overhand, and center thrust. In the first two, the officer takes advantage of the suspect's forward momentum in making the throw. The center thrust is most dangerous, and this defense has been developed for it. This method provides the greatest area of possible contact with the suspect's attacking arm. The follow-through should be one continuous motion rapidly executed. For years, police officers have been using holds which are not only easily broken, but dangerous to apply. The hand grips are examples of these.
A smart opponent knows that his free hand may be used to break any hold of this pipe. The advantage lies with the officer only when he can apply two hands against one. In any contest of two against two, the stronger pair will always win. The straight arm and the wrist come-alongs are easily broken, and great is the fall of the officer who relies too confidently on such restraining methods. These holds, improperly applied by an inexperienced officer, lay him wide open to successful counterattack by a clever suspect. Recruit should learn a few holds well, practice them often, and avoid the dangerous and spectacular. The rear strangle is only effective when the suspect is held off balance with the free hand. The instant he is permitted to stand erect, the officer is liable to float through the air with the greatest of ease. Here a class of recruit officers learns the various holds and restraining methods outlined in this film. After the instructor's demonstration, each student practices the technique upon his teammate. As in any other phase of police work, practice makes perfect, and these officers will recall and use the fundamentals of self-defense and disarmament continually during their tours of duty in the field.